Hey everyone, welcome back in. It's another episode of the Wobcast 2.0. It's season two, episode five, getting tough in the trenches. That's what the Minnesota Vikings need to do heading into 2023. I'm your host, Mike Wobshaw. It's Wobby with the usual cast of characters. As we are set to take a look at the Vikings offensive line in this episode, we spent some time so far this offseason talking about the defense with the hiring of a new defensive coordinator. And then on the offensive side of the ball, we focus primarily on some of the pass catchers, the wide receivers. Today, though, we go into the trenches on the offensive side and discuss how the Vikings can get better there. To do that, let's bring in the usual cast of characters, Giles and Chase. Hey, fellas, how's it going? Hey, hey, we're doing well. Uh, any week that the Minnesota Vikings are ranked the number one organization in the NFL is a good week. Um, definitely exciting when you think about heading into free agency and really attracting the best talent to ultimately chase a championship. We're sitting in a good spot. I, I think you're right about that. Chase, did it surprise you to see the Vikings number one on that list? A little bit, just because of the, all the uh, everything that comes with being like a Vikings fan. I thought that some of that would go to the players. But uh, to see us number one in happiness, I was like, ah, you know, (laughs) I'll take it. Yeah. So if you haven't seen that list, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to look it up right now, but essentially it it was a poll of, you know, 1300 players. Mm -hmm. um, And it was like a team report card. And, you know, they, I don't know exactly all the criteria, but it it talked about as a player, how does the organization treat you? You know, and I think it was trying to get away from like, what's the win loss record and how many years in a row have you made the playoffs? And it's getting more into like, what's the staff, like the training staff, the strength staff, the marketing, whoever, you know, how are you out in the community, whatever. And the Viking facilities, yeah, Yeah. the facilities. Yeah, exactly. The Viking food, the meals, the, yep. The yep. Number one. Yep. No surprise to me. I mean, we talked about this a little bit pre-show guys, but uh, one thing we didn't talk about was the facility. I mean, TCO performance center is top notch. I mean, it's gigantic. It's on the cutting edge of technology. It's got a great amount of space. It's got indoor, it's got outdoor, it's got a great meeting room situation. Like I said, the technology is top notch. Um, The food is good. The cafeteria is cool. It's a beautiful part of the Metro area. It's an attractive place to live and uh, to be. So it's right by the airport. So it's just very convenient. So no, I, w- I was not surprised at all. Plus, as we did talk about pre-show, you have the novelty of new GM, new coach. You just went 13 and or 14 and three. So like all of that also factored in. Mm-hmm. And I think Giles, you made a good point. You know, this is good for the recruitment of players, mm-hmm. right? I mean, is it? Is it the thing that's going to be the difference? No, it's not. I mean, the commanders who came in rank 32nd are still going to be able to sign some free agents, but Mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt either. Yep. If a, if a deal is close, if if you're going to offer a similar contract, people might lean to come towards the men in purple versus anywhere else. For sure. So, um, you know, so uh, kind of a cool uh, distinction for the Vikings to carry here into the off season. And, and this is, you know, this is the business season. It's the off season Mm -hmm. for on-field stuff. But uh, we're right at the at the beginning of the the business season for NFL teams. In fact, one of the tentpole events of the entire NFL calendar is happening right now, guys. It's the combine yeah. in Indianapolis, where um, the bloodline of the NFL, I would say, is the draft or draft picks, and and this is really a key part of the process for teams when you look at the draft and and the lifeblood of the NFL and. You know, this, this is, I, I'm not going to call it the Super Bowl for the scouting department because I think the draft is the Super Bowl for the scouting department, but this is like the conference championship game for yeah. the scouting departments. You know, yeah. um, where when all the foundation comes, gets laid. Yeah. And this is really where you're beginning to reach consensus on players, mm-hmm. you know, because up to this point, the scouts, they've been studying these players for years. Even mm-hmm. like, you know, it's, you're not only studying players who are coming out in the draft that year. I mean, you're watching tape on, on certain positions um, for every year, freshmen through seniors. So mm-hmm. a lot of these players, you as a scout, you've been studying them for three, four five years. And now you're bringing the coaches into the mix for the mm-hmm. first time. And you're starting to build consensus as an organization on these players. 
And it's not just the first round, it's the second round, third round and beyond it's undrafted priority free agents that you want to sign. Mm -hmm. So really an exciting time. It, it also is sort of the unofficial launch of the new year mm -hmm. uh, for NFL teams. It marks a period of optimism. It marks a period of refreshing. Everyone is zero and zero. You slap the chiefs on the back for a great season. And now everyone's looking forward to 2023. So really kind of a fun place. And then as a fan, you're hearing from your GM, you're hearing from your coach, uh, you're starting to build up some excitement for free agency. So the combine really is a fun uh, period on the NFL offseason calendar. I went to the combine for must have been 11 or 12 years, spent a week in Indianapolis every year for 11 straight years. And, you know, it, it's an NFL convention. I mean, everyone oh, yeah. who's anyone is there. And yep. you can't walk down your hallway in your hotel. You can't walk through the lobby. You can't sit down at a, at a restaurant or a bar without seeing, you know, in Somebody. my time, you know, Ted Thompson right over there, Bill Belichick right over there, Sean McVay right over here, mm -hmm. Ozzie Newsom having lunch with, you know, um, uh, Les Snead right over there. I mean, it's just, it's really cool. It's a great yeah. spot to be. Um, yeah, underrated city. <laughs> It is an under, and you just were there, Giles. Were you? Yeah, not? I just got back. Yeah, I yeah. got back right before it started. I really uh, uh, played around in my head about staying uh, a few days <laughs> extra just did. to bump into some people. But yeah. uh, senior thoughts prevailed. I had to back had to head back for work, but uh, yeah. definitely they were starting to set up. It was a, it was a fun time. Yep. So um, I'm sure you saw some signage, right? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, very cool. Anyway, around the city. But anyway, your thoughts? Anything from you guys before we get into offensive line and the Vikings? combine any, any thoughts so far anything you've seen watching the coverage or heard from Vikings brass that has stood out to you so far yeah I mean honestly this can turn into a full episode based on the yeah. uh, kind of information pouring out of the the indie uh, space right now but I definitely think there's been a few uh, uh, press conferences for example between uh, Kwesi and, and Kevin O'Connell kind of highlighting and and tipping their hand one way or the other on what they're going to do with the existing players I think Kirk Cousins I think uh We'll know probably pretty quickly what their plan is long term with him. I think if they're going to extend him, I believe uh, uh, Tom Pelissero Pelissero came out and said that uh, he thinks that they're going to have a long term extension potentially in contrast to a short term one. I guess we'll see what uh, what happens. But I think some of these domo dominoes are going to start to fall now. Uh, now that they've understood, hey, these are some players that we want to be able to target. Uh, yeah. Now I think their plan is going to start to fall into place. But I think. Uh, Starting next week, I think we'll get a little bit more uh, activity out of the, the combine and understand what that's actually going to mean for the rest of the offseason. Yeah. So uh, you're right. This is a whole episode into, <laughs> into itself. We want to focus on the offensive line today, and we're going to do that. So if you're super interested in that, stay tuned. But just bear with us through this one thing. And you mentioned the Cousins thing in a contract. So yep. as you analyze it, Giles, because we, we know you do very carefully, do you feel that i mean it's it's either his contract gets restructured or there's a an extension mm -hmm. or he gets traded a lot of people have talked about that he gets mm -hmm. traded or nothing happens and he just plays it out yep right yep so are are any of those not feasible Honestly, after recent events, I think all those options are on the table. And the reason why is that John Lynch came out, uh, for those of you that don't know who that is, that's the GM for the 49ers. He yep. came out and said that he needs to explore the veteran quarterback market, market. because yep. he is not necessarily confident in his room based on the existing availability and health of his existing quarterbacks. Yes. So they're in a win now window. They have an amazing roster in pretty much every position. Um, from a cap plate or cap space standpoint, I think they have a little bit of wiggle room. So I think they think now is our time to go win the Super Bowl because if we hadn't gotten hurt at the quarterback position last year, we probably would have won the Super Bowl, to be honest, yeah. um, for being completely real based on their roster. So, um, and, and they're obviously their coach, Kyle uh, Shanahan is phenomenal. He's, yeah. he's a, a player that I, or a, a coach that would have, I think went toe to toe with uh, Mr. Reed from Kansas yeah. city. But all yeah. that to say, I think with that message coming out of the 49ers organization, I think, if you're looking at all the uh, available quarterbacks, so to speak, whether they're technically available or not, Kirk Cousins has to be at the top of that list for the 49ers. Now, it is speculative to say that the 49ers trade for him because obviously a few things would have to happen, including Kirk Cousins waiving his no trade clause. But I think if you were to trade Kirk anywhere, 49ers would need the place that you would do it. One, because it's a win now window for them. He's not getting yeah. traded to the, the commanders or something in a place where they're not a good organization, nor are they in a, bit, um, in a, in a space to win. 49ers are and more importantly he already has 
very strong connections with their leadership. So yeah. if you're going to trade him anywhere, I think the 49ers would be it. And now they're finally in a place where they want to search for someone like uh, Kirk. So definitely an option. I think uh, recently, uh, we'll talk more about this potentially next week in terms of who the Vikings have talked to and what do they like. They did talk to Anthony Richardson um, from Florida State um, in terms of uh, potential players that they could draft from, uh, uh, you know, in a quarterback position. If they decide, hey, Anthony Richardson's the guy, we think he's the long-term uh, future of the franchise. I think that will help dictate whether or not the, the the Vikings move forward in that capacity because Quezzy talked about this a little bit, but I don't think he's in a position where he wants to move off of Kirk Cousins unless there is a solidified option number two. He doesn't want to say, oh, you're expensive, so we need to get rid of you. Whether you love him or hate him, he is not a train wreck. He is a decent quarterback. Yeah. Now, some people don't believe he'll win a Super Bowl. You know, Regardless of that opinion, Quazy doesn't want to move off from Kirk unless he has a plan on what he's going to go to next. Agreed. You don't want to waste the talent of Justin Jefferson bringing in a nobody and wasting all of that premier talent. He wants to have a an above average quality quarterback behind center to be able to throw to Justin Jefferson. So if they like Anthony Richardson, I think there's a chance that they're going to make some moves to make Kirk uh, not the quarterback either this year or in the, the next year or two. Um, so really, it, it really depends on their option moving forward, if that makes sense. Yeah. I, the, the comments from John Lynch, they struck me too, Giles mm -hmm. and not just from a cousin standpoint, but I, but from a, an Aaron Rodgers standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't believe Derek Carr would, would be a place they would go, but you know, yeah. he's available also, but it was striking to me that, well, and, and it also was confusing I believe I heard Kyle Shanahan say he does not see a scenario where Jimmy Garoppolo comes back to them. I, 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 I believe he said that he did. He came out and said that. Yep. And I want to know more about that because now John Lynch is saying, well, we may be in the veteran quarterback market. Mm -hmm. And if you put Jimmy Garoppolo in the veteran quarterback market, I mean, I, I would put him, I think you can argue him over Derek Carr. Oh, absolutely. For sure. For sure yeah. I think you can. Yeah. 10 times out of 10. Um, and I, I'm not going to do this with you, Giles, but some people would, would argue Jimmy G is in the Kirk Cousins uh, tier. Yep. You know? uh, yeah. It's and, a very common opinion. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't yeah. know if that's really true. I think body of work, Kirk Cousins has Garoppolo beat, but Garoppolo's been in big games that Cousins yep. hasn't been in. So yep. he's gone he to the Super Bowl. That. But <laughs> yeah, point is, you had Shanahan say, I'm not, in, I can't see Garoppolo coming back at all. And now mm -hmm. Lynch saying we're in the market. So I'm confused about that. And I yep. am sure there's a clear vision there and I mm -hmm. just don't know it. This oh, is not course. me ripping on the Niners. I'm just saying, yeah. I don't, I don't know what the vision yeah. is there. They haven't revealed their plan yet. Right. Suffice it to say, I think Rogers and cousins, they have not drawn a line through those two names. So I think you're mm -hmm. right about that. that. That's a possibility. What I think is close to not feasible is play is just playing out this deal with cousins. And yeah. I think that isn't feasible because it's like, it's such a huge cap hit. They got to find a way to, to slash that cap hit to be able to mm -hmm. operate from a cap perspective. So mm -hmm. we'll be very interesting. That's a key domino that needs to fall is yep. what happens with cousins on the contract trade mm -hmm. restructure, resign, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, yep. I don't think it's, I don't think inaction is an option is a, is a responsible option with cousins. I think the only way that that occurs is if they find the next quarterback and they say, Anthony Richardson is the guy now, yeah. whether they do or they don't, I guess in reality, that that's another conversation, but let's say they, they do, uh, and they decide they want to go down that path. Then if they go to cousins and say, Hey, we want to have you be there for one more year, but we need to lower your cap. It. Are you willing to um, either get traded or restructure? And he says, no, but they want to an draft Anthony Richardson. I think they might play it out on the existing contract just okay. to get rid of him. Yeah. Um, you know, if they do decide they want to move on now, that is pure speculation. Maybe they want to stay on with Kirk. I, I really don't know. But yeah. uh, if that is the case, I think that's the only scenario in which they play out the existing contract. Yeah. And I was big proponent of playing out the existing contract before the last extension. Mm -hmm. because I, I was at a point where I was just like, I think cousins is a good, not great player. And I think this is where he can take us and that's it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, let the deal play out. He goes on into free agency and you draft the next guy. And that didn't mm -hmm. end up happening. I, I'm not so sure that's the right move here. I, I think 
and Anthony Richardson may be the guy or some other quarterback may be the guy that they end up getting. I, I don't know, but it, yeah, probability wise to get back to the playoffs, win the division and make a run at the Super Bowl. I think the highest probability that the Vikings do that is with cousins in 2023. I, I don't. Yeah. Uh, Unless you're kicking the can down the road saying 2025 is our year. Unless you're, you're, you're playing the medium term game. The shortest window is with cousins. I think so. Yeah. Which so. honestly directly leads into the conversation today. Now, whether you were going to move forward with Kirk cousins or with a different quarterback, the best case scenario, in my opinion, to be able to produce a super bowl beyond yeah. having a, and at least an above average quarterback, if not elite is to have a top five offensive line. Uh, right. If you analyze all the best winners uh, for the last five to 10 years, all of them have uh, top five or at least top 10 uh Offensive lines. If okay. You look at every year; they are that. That's a common thread among the winning organizations. I, I think you're right about that, Giles. And let's analyze that. Let's analyze the list of Super Bowl participants and what their offensive lines were like. And let's, while you're pulling that up, let's also mm -hmm. preface this where we've had we've had now. This is our our the third episode of season two in which we have been talking about top five. Now we know you can't be top five in everything every year. We know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also know you better be top five in a bunch of stuff, correct? Right? Um, if you if you want to get to the big game and win it, so mm -hmm. we talked about how do you become a top five offense in the NFL? How do you become a top five defense in the NFL? So now we're talking about how do you get? We're, we're kind of drilling down a little bit deeper, a top mm -hmm. five position group, a top five offensive line in the NFL, and how can you do it? So mm -hmm. let's 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 explain via the data that you have. Mm -hmm. why we have identified O-line as maybe one of the higher priority position groups to be top five in the NFL. Explain why, Giles, right here with the Super Bowl participants. A hundred percent. So I'll go over the last five years, who the winners are and what their respective positions were for their offensive line. But yeah. at the end of the day, if you're looking at the overarching kind of uh, narrative that's happening, really – you're, you're preparing yourself to protect your quarterback, whether you're running or passing, it gives you the ability to be unpredictable. And the idea that you have a, if you have a top five offensive line, more than likely they can both run and pass block very, very effectively, which means you're now opening up your playbook. When you open up your playbook, that gives you so many options to kind of exploit the other team. Right. So yes. if you go back as, as far as like 2018, for example, after the 2018 season, now, if people remember correctly, the new England Patriots won the Super Bowl that year, Okay. that year, they had the fourth best offensive line. Now, this is where the conversation of variance comes into play with the quarterback. Um, when you look at someone like Tom Brady, obviously he, until proven otherwise, he's the best quarterback of all time, but he is, for better or for worse, the prototypical statue quarterback. He is not yes. a mobile quarterback. He does not move with his legs, at least in a, in a very regular fashion. Um, so having a top five offensive line was very, very important for him. He happened to have the fourth best. Um, they also had a great offensive line coach and the New, New England Patriots for the majority of his tenure always prioritize offensive line as the second priority to keeping Tom Brady happy. Keeping yeah. Tom Brady and then keeping a top five offensive line was always their priority. If you look back uh, for yep. the past 20 years, they always had top five offensive lines. And if they didn't, they were at least top 10 and they had an injury, right? So yeah. that was one of the formulas for them to go win. Now, if you move on to uh, 2019, uh, that's where this does get a little bit of a wrench into the play. I'm trying to find my tab here, but uh, the the New England or the, the Kansas City Chiefs, Chiefs. rather, happened yeah. to be just outside the top 10. So the reason why I think that that is okay is because he's an incredibly mobile quarterback. He still had around yeah. a top 10 offensive line. He did not have a train wreck, I guess, is the, the main point here. You're not going to have something where he's going to get sacked every game, which yep. you contrast that to the, the year or year after that, when they did go to the Super Bowl again, they lost because their offensive line was bad. They right? got I mean, smoked. That was their, oh, my smoked. goodness. It was so yeah. bad. He was pressured was Tampa, on Tampa, right? Thir correct, against Tampa, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's where if you, I believe that was the 2020 season, uh, if I'm looking at this, uh, correctly, right. 2020, yep, yep. That was where they were there. Um, the offensive line got decimated and they lost because of that. Well, it just so happens the op uh, opposite team, the opposing team, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they had the fifth best offensive line. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. And when you think about Tom Brady, a lot of people said, oh, he picked the Bucs because that's where, you know, he liked the staff there. I mean, although all those things are true, I think one of the biggest reasons that he went to the Bucs is he knew he could get them into a top five posture from an offensive line standpoint. Sure. Um, they were a brick wall for him, which is something required for Tom, for Tom Brady. He's always had phenomenal uh, offensive lines. You move into 2021, um, and that's where the Rams won. They were, I don't know my thing up here either. I think they were just, uh, I think they were maybe seventh. 
sixth or seventh. So they weren't yeah. in the top five, um, but they they did okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, Matthew Stafford was a little bit more mobile than most, um, but they were still in a top 10 posture. Go to 2022, yeah. the Philadelphia Eagles are number one, and they obviously almost won the Super Bowl. They're the only team in Super Bowl history to have lost the Super Bowl, having scored 35 points. So yes, I will right. view that as a little bit of an asterisk on, on the yeah. route. So they were the number one overall offensive line. And uh, I believe the Kansas City Chiefs were maybe eighth or seventh. Uh, once again, you have a, a very mobile quarterback. So you have a top 10 uh, type of trend here when it comes to Super Bowl winners. And even the ones that are playing in the Super Bowl, going the distance, one of the formulas to do that is to have a great, a great stout offensive line. Now, when you contrast that to the Minnesota Vikings, we have arguably one of the most statuesque quarterbacks in the league. Now, a lot of people use that as a negative. I'm not meaning to cause judgment or I'm not trying to get praise or judgment here. I'm just simply saying, if you operate with the belief that Kirk Cousins will be quarterback in 2023, how do you win with him? Now, some people will try right. to give excuses. I'm not interested in excuses. I'm just saying, if you have to win, if you are gun to the head, you have to win. I think giving Kirk Cousins a top five on top five offensive line is a requirement for us to win the Super Bowl. Um, when you think about all the reasons that he has failed, offensive line has been one of those biggest issues because we have the best uh, wide receiver in the league. We have a top five tight end um, until Dalvin cook is no longer on the team. We have an above average, if not elite running back, we have a great head coach. We have a lot of good weapons. I think the last piece is giving him a top five offensive line so he can be protected to make throws because he's hyper accurate. He can throw the ball anywhere on the field. If you give him an op uh, a great offensive line, I think all these things go away. Yep. So, so then Giles, the question is, how do we do it? Right. Yep, and exactly. because I don't, I don't think any Vikings fan would disagree that they want the offensive line to be good. Mm -hmm. I think where you will get disagreement among the fan base and potentially where you could get disagreement as an organization is how you go about acquiring the personnel to get you to be top five. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the names who are the guys it's, it's, how you have to prioritize it. it mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I, I've, I've seen a lot of people, this, this Texas running back, people are like, Oh my gosh, if he's there, you got to think about him and mm -hmm. talking about wide receivers and how great it, we talked about wide receivers a couple episodes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the ones that we liked or a couple weeks ago, it's like, I know, I know that I know that it would be great to get those guys, but you, you need a top five offensive line. You have to invest in that. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, and we'll do this, we'll look at some other offensive lines around the league and how they were constructed. They weren't constructed by, you know, taking wide receivers and running backs early on in the draft. You know, they're mm -hmm. constructed by considering offensive linemen early in the draft. Now the, the devil's advocate to that is, well, they took O'Neal early and they took Darisaw early. They took Bradbury early. Like they have been addressing it. And it's like, yeah, that, that is true, but that doesn't mean you should stop. I still think they have a ways to go. So let's, however, while I do think they have a ways to go to get their guys, I think it's achievable. When I look at the avenues that you can use to generate improvement, it's player development, players you already have and getting them to be better. Mm -hmm. It is draft and it's free agency. I think it's achievable for the Vikings to be close, to be knocking on the door. Um, let's look at what worked and what didn't in 2022. Let's do it. From a high level standpoint, I'll begin and then you take it from there. Yeah. I would say on the edge, uh, very good. Darisa mm -hmm. O'Neill, I don't know that there's many tandems better than that. You know, like I'd They're say the best, actually. When you look okay. at the, the PFF rankings, they have the like, number one tackle room in the NFL. Okay, so PFF would say they are. Yep. Now, now McGlinchey and um, and uh, your guy in San Francisco on left side. Trent Mc, Williams. McGlinchey and Williams, that's pretty dang good. Like I, yep. uh, Lane Johnson in Philly and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jordan Maletta, that's pretty mm -hmm. good. You know, uh, But yep. O'Neal and Darisaw right there, if not better. So yep. you're good Agreed. there. You're soft on the interior. Um, yep. and I don't, I, again, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. So mm -hmm. the question is, how do you get better there? And people just are very hesitant guiles to spend first round picks on guards and centers. Mm -hmm. It's not sexy. It's not fun. And there's lots of examples of teams doing that and it fails. Mm -hmm. And when you look back two, three years on drafts and you're like, oh yeah, we took that right guard, but we could have had. JJ Watt, you know, we could have had TJ Watt, we could have had, you know, 
mm-hmm. Justin Jefferson about, Nope, we took a guard. Right. So, um, so there's that. Um, I, and I think the data is going to back that up soft mm-hmm. on the interior and really great on the outside. Right. A hundred percent. When you look at uh, our starting lineup in the 2022 season, you have Christian Derrissaw, you have Ezra Cleveland, Garrett Bradbury, Ed Ingram, and then Brian O'Neill. Christian Derrissaw obviously graded out at a 90.4 grade. He was the number two overall PFF graded player. In my opinion, the only reason he was number two is because he was hurt for a game or two, but he played half a game hurt uh, before he was taken out. Um, So that dinged him just slightly where he was the number two graded player just behind Trent Williams. And he lost by uh, point something like it was okay. a very, very small margin. Yeah. Um, and if you go over to the right side to Brian O'Neill, he was the eighth graded, uh, PFF grade player. Uh, he had an 83.1. And that's where I think this gives a slight edge to the Minnesota Vikings in contrast to the Eagles, because Lane Johnson was the fifth, uh, fifth best player. Um, and Jordan um, on the on the other side uh, was the tenth best player. So although they are very elite in that category, I think we're just slightly ahead of them because okay. of the upside and also the cap hit for Christian Derrissa. I mean, he's still on a rookie contract, so I think that really sure. gives you a lot of flexibility. Yeah. Um, so phenomenal tackle room. I think you're sitting very very great. Now yeah. when you move inside, you go to Ezra Cleveland. He ended the season at a seventy three point four grade. Um, was quite elite in the run blocking game was not so great in the pass blocking game. Uh, He ended the year at a 54.1 pass block grade. So that's where I think you're really at a a crossroads. Do you say, oh, Ezra Cleveland is just not a good pass blocker? Or was this one of those areas where they were trying to make others better so then they sacrifice this year? So I think if you keep Ezra Cleveland at left guard and you are able to do something at center, which we'll get to here in a second, I do think Ezra Cleveland's performance in pass blocking does improve. So the point is you're, you're sitting not in a train wreck position with the left yeah. guard position. In fact, he was actually graded the, the 10th overall guard in the NFL last year, just behind nine others. Really? He, was, he was doing okay. great. Um, and that's because he was so elite in the run game. He had a 79.7 grade. So he was um, basically an 80 grade from a pass or a, a run blocking standpoint. Yeah. Um, if you can prove a little bit in the pass blocking, you're sitting pretty good. I mean, he was even ahead of Zach Martin from the Dallas Ooh. Cowboys, okay. which he is a household name in the guard community. So For the sure. fact that he ended that way shows at bare minimum, you were not a train wreck. Now, obviously our goal is not to be not a train wreck. It is to be a top five offensive line. So um, when I'm looking at improving places, although that is an area I do want to see improvement, that's not the first place that I'm going to start. And All that's right. where we go to the center position. So that's Garrett Bradbury. He ended yeah. the year at a 67.5 grade. He did far better in the run blocking game than he did the the run game or uh, the pass blocking uh, uh, game, but he was a average to slightly above average center, um, which uh, from a PFF grade standpoint, when you think about that. Now, when you look at the overall grades, he actually ended the year as the 11th best center. Um, he was uh, just behind Connor McGovern from the Jets. Um, you know, uh, I mean, there was a lot of pretty good centers, honestly, in the in the, the league this year, so that pushed him down to 11th, but at bare minimum, Garrett Bradbury was not a train wreck, but I do believe okay. that is an area where we need strength. I think uh, his not a train wreck, but not elite category was what led to the downfall for Ezra Cleveland, um, which then leads us to the right guard position. And that's where our biggest, weakest link happened. And that's that's Ed Ingram. He ended the year at a 57.0 grade, um, yeah. did okay in the run game, but did horrible in the pass blocking game. He ended yeah. the year at a 42.6 grade. Um, now I've said it before, I'll say it again. Ed Ingram is the physical specimen that I want to see in a guard. Physically, he is exactly what you want to see. And when you look at all of his deficiencies in the 2022 season, a lot of them were, uh, uh, was a, uh, a rookie mistake type concept, in, yep. in my opinion. He was, uh, uh, you said that quite way. a bit, Giles. Yeah. You said that quite yeah. a bit. Yep. Now, rookie mistake can be categorized in two different ways. Either, oh, that's fixable. Now that he's played, he has a good offseason, it'll get fixed. Or he continues making them. He maintains a a rookie posture in his head. So I'm hoping that he can fix that. I'm confident in our offensive line coach. Um, But at the end of the day, that is a major question mark going into the 2023 season, a question mark that I'm concerned to actually go into the season with. Although if you shift a few things, I actually think he'd be a great guard. I'm, I'm questioning whether you actually go into the season that way. Do you, do you want to take that risk that he, that he actually fixes those mistakes and goes into it? Because Once again, the offensive line is a game of weakest link. If you maintain the posture of a 42.6 pass blocking grade going into the next season, there's no shot in hell that you're going to be able to be the um, top five offensive line. I'm just sorry. That's not going to happen. So 
if you're analyzing the things that worked well, you had their tackles. They were elite in pretty much every category. Your left guard was above average. Uh, he was elite in run game. Um, need a little bit of improvement in pass. If you can upgrade the center position to help out both guards, I think both guards do improve. Um, but right guard has to be the number one um, source of improvement this next offseason. Now that's up to the coaching staff to say, we're either going to fix his mistakes and he's going to be elite, or you need to switch him out with somebody else. Yep. If that makes sense. So it does make sense. I, I just... We can't, I can't see the future. I, we can only go off of what our sense is, what our intuition is. Mm -hmm. If uh, like you can put Randall McDaniel at, at left guard. Mm -hmm. And if you go in there with Darisa O'Neal and Randall McDaniel, and then Bradbury and Ingram, you're not going to mm -hmm. be a top five offensive line. Yep. Okay. Because it's, it's the bottom is too low on the combination of Bradbury and Ingram you, that that has to come up. So right. um, there needs to be new blood in there. Mm -hmm. And I, I have great respect for the ability to develop players and the Vikings coaching staff might be able to do that. And I fully understand that if you can get five men working together as one unit on the offensive line, it's all about the sum of the parts, not about the individual parts Correct. that. But yep. you cannot have a top five. You will not have a top five offensive line if it's those three guys playing together on the inside. Mm -hmm. So, and even if you got a Hall of Famer in there at left guard or right guard, I still think the other two got to come up and be better. So, mm -hmm. the but the problem is, what's it going to cost? Can you afford it? What's it going to cost you? That's the problem. Yep. Now, if you go through the draft, that's affordable. Mm -hmm. but you lose the certain, like there's unknown there because you don't know how good those guys are going to be. If you go through free agency, you have a known commodity there, but it's going to cost you a little bit more. I think they got to do both. I think they have to sign someone to come in and start. And then I think they have to draft someone in the top hundred to compete, to be a starter. And you would hope to win a starting position. Mm -hmm. So I'll hear you on Ezra Cleveland. I have more, I would have more confidence in him developing to be a suitable starter than I do at Ingram mm -hmm. at this point. Agreed. And I just think Garrett Bradbury, I just don't know that he's got it. Mm -hmm. I've seen too many examples of him just getting pushed around and beat up yep. in there. Yep. And I think we patch things over with him to give him into a non train wreck capacity. I think, I think so that's too. the one position where if you want to, have the other positions not fail, you need to be elite at the center position. Yeah. So this, you know, this kid from the Gophers, John Michael Schmitz, I think if you got him and then you signed whoever, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a starting right guard who another team just couldn't afford to keep, you know, to yeah. me, that's ideal. Mm -hmm. Um, I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. And that's where, yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of different ways that we can tackle this and we can go over, um, free agency, maybe trade. And then also the draft and kind of explore who those players could be. Um, cause I definitely think there is a route to make that happen. I think there's some pretty phenomenal, uh, free agents, for example, that could be available. And also, uh, obviously via the draft to help patchwork that together. If right. you say, Hey, we're in a, a win now window, um, where we think if we can't win the Super Bowl this year, we have to hit a reset. If we're going to have to push a few more cards into the table uh, or into the center of the table to make this happen, what would we go do? That's where I think there is a route to making this happen. And it, in my opinion, it starts with Isaac uh, Samalo from the Philadelphia oh, Eagles. He's a free agent. It. He's uh, on my list. Yeah, he came yep. from the best offensive line in football from a yep. wide margin. He ended the, the year at a 72.7 grade, um, and that's where um, he wasn't as great in the run, but he was elite, and I mean elite in the pass. Um, he's 303 pounds. He's only I mean, he's 29 years old, so he's not necessarily young, but he's also not old. He's 6'4". He is a phenomenal example of what I want a guard to be. Plus he just looks the part. Like when you yep. look at him, he just looks mean. And that's exactly what I want out of a guard. So if I had my pick of the litter, I'd go directly to the Philadelphia Eagles uh, pending free agent and go sign Isaac. Um, Cause that's, I think an instant upgrade at the right guard position, go patch that over. So then on both sides, um, whether it's run or pass, you have elite left and right sides. And that's where I think, you know, uh, we can talk about the center position here in a little bit, but, uh, you know, I think that's a great spot to be now. All right. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, yeah. I'm going to interject here. So don't, yeah. don't lose your train yeah, of thought. Yeah. Um, Samulu is like, he's on my, I said, he's on my list. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, I mean, 
anyone who knows a shred of football knows that he's a good player. It's like, Mm -hmm. this is not a hot take, like go sign him. Okay. Well, great. I mean, everyone (laughs) would love to sign him. I have to say though, spot rack, which is one of my favorite places to go to look at salaries. Um, it's a, it's a website called spot rack S P O T R A C. Yep. They calculated his market value as 12.1 million per year. Mm-hmm. And I found that to be like, that's not too hard of a pill to swallow to me. Though. Not at all. Yeah, uh, when you think about overpaying for a position, that's not something that is going to train wreck you in other positions. Yeah, that's doable. I think it is too. And you know, they, had him, deal. they had him as the eighth ranked guard, mm-hmm. um, given his market value. Um, mm-hmm. And they're estimating you, you need to sign him two years, 24 million. That's their that's their projected contract for him. So mm-hmm. I think it's because of his age, Giles. You mentioned he's 29. So I don't know his, I'm not wrote on his history. I don't know if he, if this is actually his third contract or what, what happened. He was a third round pick. So regardless, mm-hmm. maybe he's looking for more years than that, than a two-year deal. But, you know, spot rack is saying two years, um, 24 million, 12.1 uh, on an average annual basis. I, I'd be all about that. And I think, the great thing about a move like this is at guard as opposed to center is mm-hmm. if you do this at right guard Giles, it just, you know, he's not coming in to compete to start. Like that's your starting right guard right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now Ed Ingram is at a minimum, he's just a backup right guard, mm-hmm. but I move him over and train him. I cross train him to the left. Yeah. I cross train Chris Reed over there. Yep. And now it's like, Ezra, we believe in you and we're projecting you to be our starter, but we got Ed Ingram and Chris mm-hmm. Reed and Ole Udo competing their ass off to come and take your, I think you get better on the left side too. I completely agree. And at bare minimum, you have solid depth because yeah. obviously with the Philadelphia or the, the Kansas city chiefs that one year, they had a great offensive line the entire year, but then got hurt at the end and it train yep. wrecked their super bowl. So I think the entire point here is that you need to go into the super bowl with a top five offensive line, not just have one during the season. Yeah. Obviously, during the season is important too, but to win the Super Bowl, you need to go into it with that in mind. So my, and and I, I kind of hope the Vikings get the Gopher kid, John Michael Schmitz. But if I could, yeah. if it was just like one one move, you get mm-hmm. to pick it. I'd be like, sign Isaac Samulo. I, I think yep. if they do that, I think they improve in two spots, um, by virtue of getting more depth at left guard, and so you derive improvement from there. Plus you've improved at right guard. Obviously you've upgraded yep. over Ed Ingram. So mm-hmm. I don't think you stunt Ed Ingram's development at all. If anything, I think mm-hmm. you make him a more versatile player by cross training him to the left side. Mm-hmm. And the other guy I have on my list is Connor McGovern, who you mentioned earlier. And yep. I think he'd be a good signing at center, but yep. you, you don't get those same byproducts of yep strengthening other positions because you're just swapping him for Bradbury and you're not going to get, and you're not going to keep Bradbury and sign McGovern and have a great backup in Garrett Bradbury. You're just making a one for one swap. So to me, signing the right guard is, is the preferable route there. I completely agree because I believe Connor McGovern is, all intents and purposes, the same as Garrett Bradbury. They had almost identical PFF grades in both pass, run, and overall. They're about the same weight, okay. same height. Like, they're similar players. Now, I, I think, uh, like you mentioned, if we can send that via the draft uh, in the center position, that would be by far and away the best route. Because yeah. even if you can't get Isaac Samalu from the Eagles, I think there are a few other options in free agency you could try to explore. It just depends on what you want to prioritize. Because you have someone like... Um, uh, Will Hernandez from the Arizona okay. Cardinals. He's a free agent. Yeah. He did end the year at a 65.4 grade, which is not great. Uh-huh. However, he was elite in pass blocking. He was average or below average in run. So you'd be giving up your run blocking and sacrifice for pretty phenomenal pass blocking, which yeah. I will entertain. I wouldn't say that's my preference going into the season, but if I have to prioritize one versus the other, I would much rather have elite pass blocking than elite run blocking. Uh, maybe that's naive. And maybe that, there, I mean, you can shoot a lot of holes through that, but that's my, if you have to be binary about it, I'd much rather have pass blocking eliteness than the other way around. Sure. Um, so Will Hernandez is definitely a guy. And I think in an even bigger category would be Ben Powers from the Baltimore Ravens oh, yeah. the year with a 62.3 grade. So he v- was even worse overall, but he was even better at pass blocking. He had almost a 90 grade in pass blocking, but he ended the year at a 50 grade in the run, which okay. I will say he's coming from a very 
unique circumstance when it comes to, to run blocking. So I won't count that 50 entirely against him because they don't have a traditional run game. So yeah. I think there's a chance that you could improve that, but also you can maybe get him on the cheap and the idea that people look at him as a 62.3 graded player, but really he's a much better, better player than what that looks like. So Ben Powers, honestly, if you can't get Isaac Zamalu, Ben Powers might be my number one option. Okay. I don't hate that at all. And I, I hadn't looked at him, but I, I think that'd be a good, a good choice. I actually think the market's um, pretty decent. I yeah. think the free agent market is pretty decent for offensive linemen this year. And, you know, I think there's a lot of fool's gold in free agency, guys. I mean, believe me, I've seen lots of uh, signings come in that you think you got a great one, and it just turns out to be terrible. There's a lot of fool's gold out there. But the offensive mm -hmm. line market, I like it. I mm -hmm. um, I would I would entertain it and engage in it. Um mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be afraid to let Garrett Bradbury get into it. I wouldn't be afraid to let some of your offensive line free agents get into the market and see, I think they're going to be, I think it's a buyer's market on the offensive mm -hmm. line. I think mm -hmm. for the players, they're going to be a little disappointed in what's out there. Um, mm -hmm. So um, when it comes to free agency, I, I hope, you know, I would look at guard over center and I would use the draft for center. Mm -hmm. That's the way I'd approach it. Yep. And I think if you sign Samalu and you draft John Michael Schmitz, I'm pretty excited about that. I, I am very excited about that. I think that is, if you're going into the off season with a formula, that is the best formula to achieve success here. Um, now, obviously there's a lot of different uh, pins that need to fall for that to work. Um, so obviously you need a plan B and a plan C. Uh, I mean, you're very familiar with the war room and you understand yeah. the kind of the waterfall yeah. of effect that happens. Um, so that's where, you know, if we kind of explore the different options that could happen, if some of these things don't fall our way, how do we go tackle this? So for example, like Ethan, um, I always forget how to pronounce his uh, last post name. Uh, yeah. Po Yep. Ethan Poshitz. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, like from him. Cleveland. They always yep. produce great centers. They're great at, uh, at, at producing uh, solid people at that, that category. He ended the I year like at him. a 79 grade with a 71.5 grade in pass and then 79 in the run. So he's okay. a little bit better in the run than he was the pass, but he's still great in most of those categories. Um, although I'd prefer to have even better performance out of the center position. If you can't get John Michael Schmitz, if you have kind of determined that he's not going to be available when you're drafting and you have to go get a center elsewhere, I would almost prefer the guy from Cleveland um, over anyone else. Now let's say you do that. Not my preference, but if you had to go that way, if you had to draft a center or uh, yeah. uh, uh, sign a center and free agency with Ethan, yeah. um, and draft a guard, that's where I think uh, Osiris Torrance, um, he's projected going to the second round. So I think either you try to trade back and acquire a second round pick and draft him there. Um, I think that could be really interesting. He ended yep. the year, um, um, you know, where he was playing at an 88 grade um, with a 76 grade in pass blocking. He was an 89 in run. So he's elite in both uh, categories. He's a six, five guard, 347 pounds. Um, you know, he's a, a real big stout player that I'd be totally okay um, taking, uh, you know, in the second round to try, try to fill up your, your guard spot. He played with the, the, uh, the Gators over in Florida um, with Anthony Richardson, actually. So maybe you okay. can pair up those guys uh, potentially a little hot take there. Um, uh -huh. But at the end of the day, if you have to draft one, if you can't draft him in free agency, I think Osiris Torrance is the guy I would go. For. All right. Interesting. Yep. Um, I, I don't have a hard and fast opinion on that or in any of the draft guys yet. I like mm -hmm. the approach, but you know, we're, 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 we're taking a look at all of these position groups that we've addressed in a vacuum so mm -hmm. far. Right. So we, we totally understand, you know, we laid out the ideal plan at wide receiver and what you should, what you should do ideally. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we did it, um, on defense and now we're doing it for offensive line. We recognize that mathematically, and financially, you can't do the ideal path for all of them. So yeah. we, we know that, but we're not putting it together yet. We're looking at each one in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And I am saying that the ideal route that I can foresee is what we have laid out here um, with Isaac Samalu as you're signing at right guard, and then you mm -hmm. draft a center to start. And mm -hmm. you probably say goodbye to Bradbury via free agency most yep. likely. And then you move at Ed Ingram to a backup role at right guard and a compete to start situation at left guard, which he'll probably lose to Ezra Cleveland. Mm -hmm. um, and you increase your depth there. Love that. Now, if that doesn't work out for whatever reason, you lose the free agent bidding war. You know, there are different paths you can go down, which you laid out with Ethan Posich mm -hmm. um, at all. 
Yeah. Uh, but you know, to me, it's like, if we're talking about offensive line, I, I feel strongly enough about it to where I would be like, I, I know we projected 12 million a year for Isaac, but I'd do 15 and a half if it, if we had to, I mean, I, I, you're right, Giles. If, if cousins is the guy you have to protect him, you have to be top five off, offensive line. Yep. And I think that's one of your best ways or the best way to get there is, is the path that we laid out. So I'd much rather have a deficiency, a deficiency in other areas of the team. If it meant having a top five offense, Absolutely. if I have to prioritize a position group, although it's not sexy, this is something, a place, it's a place you have to be stout in period, especially I mean, with Kirk cousins. I, you're, you're right about that guys. And look, look, if you say, okay, so let's look at defense. I would say, you know what we have in a hypothetically, we have an elite pass rush. So mm -hmm. if we're a little, if we have a few holes in our coverage, it's okay. Cause we got an elite pass rush or vice versa. You know, we got actually, we got two lockdown corners and a great safety and you know what? So if it takes an extra beat to get to the quarterback, we're all right. We're great in the back end. Like if you're the Eagles and you had their secondary, now the Eagles have both, they have a great rush and great coverage, but yeah. you know, if you had the Eagles secondary and just an average pass rush, you'd be okay. You know, yep. because so on, with the offensive line though, you don't, the Vikings don't have that because the, the answer that you could have to a poor offensive line is a mobile quarterback who can mm -hmm. buy time and escape and throws well on the run and can improvise. And you do not have that with cousins. No. So, so it's really non-negotiable here. You mm -hmm. have to be good up front on the offensive line. So yep. to me, that means it's a spot to overpay. It's mm -hmm. a spot to over invest in the draft. Maybe you reach on a player. It's yep. okay to do that at the offensive line because you need it and you don't have a counter to it. You don't have mm -hmm. the mobile quarterback. You know what I mean? Yep. A hundred percent. And even if your plan is to move off of cousins in a year or two, um, giving yourself a top off top five offensive line unit is a great way to make a rookie quarterback succeed in the, the early years. If you look at Brock Purdy, for example, although I do believe he's a good quarterback, he had amazing infrastructure around him, including a top five offensive line. The 49ers have a great stout um, brick wall up front, and that's going to be a great place to put a rookie guy in front. So uh -huh. uh, at the end of the day, this is not something that you're just giving to cousins. This is something that you're, you're investing in for your team to win Super Bowl games, uh, not only this year, but years to come. Yeah. So, and you know what? The, the other thing we should mention here, guys, is I think that the Vikings fan is conditioned to be pessimistic about their offensive line mm -hmm. because it's been, it's basically been a problem for over a decade. Really, it yeah. has. I mean, yeah. 09, they had a really good offensive line in 09. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, in 2012, Adrian ran for 2000 yards and was the MVP, but I mean, the offensive mm -hmm. line was just okay. Uh, Adrian was just special that, yeah. I mean, his whole career, but that year he was, he was something else. So mm -hmm. this really has been a problem since 2010. Yep. So I think Vikings fans are preconditioned to be pessimistic. And, and what I want to point out is in this journey that we have set forth to be a top five offensive line, they actually have a great start because of what they have at left tackle and right tackle. They, they're off to a good start. I think if you can fix two spots on the interior, the third spot is automatically elevated. So mm -hmm. I would just go right at those two spots. Yep. A high priority free agent signing and a first or second round pick at center. That's what I would do. And I think we are, we are, like you said, already on the right path, because when you look at 2020, or I'm sorry, 2021, we were the 28th ranked offensive line overall, 28th. Um, so basically last in 2021, we were 19th. So although we were not first, nor were we top 10, we took significant strides moving forward. And that's, I think the development of Christian Derrissaw getting in there that, that shows you, Hey, you fix one position, you know, made it go from pretty bad to great. All of a sudden you went from 28th to 19th. Imagine if you take one of these other things and you, and you bring it forth, even to a top 10, I, yeah. I think it needs to be top five, but if you make another step in even addressing one of these positions, I think you take a major step forward. Even yeah. when you're analyzing Kirk Cousins and the overall offensive performance in this last season, everyone would say we did significantly better. Now, I think a lot of that is to do with uh, Kevin O'Connell, but I think another big piece of that is we weren't a train wreck on offensive line. Now, were we perfect? No, Ed Ingram was definitely not great, but showing when we had one less 
train wreck position, we performed that much greater and we were able to win that many games, right? We won yeah, 14 yeah. games. That was phenomenal. And I think a big piece of that was us making big steps up front. Now, if we take a couple of steps forward further, I think we're going to see some amazing things. Yep. I, I agree. And um, I, I think also you mentioned something earlier in the show, Giles, where we were talking about Garrett Bradbury and I was, I was a little down on him, and I just, I, I thought he got pushed around quite a bit. And, you know, you mentioned, mm -hmm. I think what you were alluding to is Kevin O'Connell schemed his way to make it work with Garrett Bradbury. Is that what you were alluding to? Yep. So, yeah, exactly. so you have the benefit of a coach who can do things like that, but, but there, there is attrition there. When, you, when you're doing that, you're giving up other things mm -hmm. that you could be doing to stress a defense mm -hmm. to compensate for that weakness. And so when you don't have to scheme your way to get around a weak point, you're mm -hmm. just that much better in your areas of strength, right? 100%. So um, um, so for we, we've already mentioned why we like the plan we laid out, but I, that's, that's the route I hope they go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the last thing I'll say is, on this one um, is reading the tea leaves from what was said at the combine with Quezzy. I think they're going like young slash cheap on defense. Mm -hmm. And I might be wrong about that. And they yep. might have a blue chip. They might go get a corner that I don't see coming, but I think, I think they're going with young athletic, cheap, moldable players for Brian Flores. And, and so and there's, yep. Yeah. Right. So there's a savings there from a cap and cash standpoint that you can apply mm -hmm. to the other side of the ball on offense. You're going to need it for Jefferson's contract. Mm -hmm. You might need it for a cousin's restructure and mm -hmm. you're going to need it for your right guard. If you're going to go get Isaac Samalo. So okay. I did sense though, that there may not be a ton of cash and cap spent on defense, which mm -hmm. is a little counterintuitive because people would say that defense was awful last year and you need to make them better. So you got to go spend a bunch, but I think they're kind of going at it from a more organic grassroots approach on the defensive side, which I'm, I'm okay with. I kind of like yep. that. Yep. Especially if you have a belief in Flores as a teacher, that's going to give you some resources to spend on offense. And Brian Flores is maybe one of the best teachers in the NFL. When you think about defensive philosophy and de defensive tactics, Brian yeah. Flores is phenomenal in that category. Now, if you reference our uh, episode from a few weeks ago, our defense wasn't as bad as it looked. When you, yeah. when you analyze the things went wrong, we gave up a thousand yards in penalties. If you simply get rid of that alone, I think we're league average. I yeah. truly believe that. Now, yeah. obviously, we're not going to be the same defense uh, from a roster standpoint that we were last year. But the thing is, I think they're looking at this from a very logical perspective, understanding, hey, the house isn't as much on fire as we think it is. We think we can at least get back to league, league average with our, our uh, second string players and maybe a few draft picks. Um, I truly believe that uh, Brian Flores is the guy to do that. Yep. So obviously it'll be fun to see what approach the Vikings end up taking. Um, if they're listening uh, to us, they're going to go sign Isaac Samalu. So, you know, uh, yeah. three years, uh, 40 million, whatever it takes, go get yep. that guy. I think whatever a lot it takes. Better. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we happen to hit a lot of the names on my list guys. In fact, we hit basically all of them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the only, the only other thing I was going to do, and, and we sort of touched on it with the Super Bowl winners and where they ranked from an offensive line standpoint. But the other thing I, I kind of wanted to do before we get out of here is take a, a look across the league at some of the better offensive lines and how those rooms are are constructed. Okay. You know, my, my three favorite rooms, and we did this with the wide receivers. I, I like, we've already talked about Philly. They were PFF's number one group preseason and number one group postseason. Mm -hmm. Um, so wire to wire, they were number one. I like Baltimore and Kansas city as well. I thought those are two groups that were pretty good. And look, the chiefs ended up giving up no sacks in the super bowl. So mm -hmm. they, they put it together and, and played well. I think green Bay has a pretty good offensive line. Mm -hmm. Um, fifth overall, actually fifth overall. Okay. Well, give me the, do you have the, the rankings right there? Do you have For 2022? Them? I do. It is okay. the Philadelphia Eagles at the number one position. Cleveland Browns are number two. The Detroit Lions are number three. Uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers are four. And then number five is the Green Bay Packers. Okay. And the uh, honorable mention is the Dallas Cowboys at six. All right. Now, because, um, and you and 
you certainly and Chase maybe suffer from the same uh, problem. Because I am unhealthily obsessed with the NFL, I understand all five of those offensive lines and how they were constructed and mm -hmm. will save the viewer, the listeners some time. But with the exception of, uh, there was one team that you said, um, it's Philly. It's Philly, Detroit, Browns, Lions. Cleveland, Cleveland. With yep. the exception of Cleveland, those squads built their offensive lines almost exclusively through the draft. Mm-hmm. I think um, Cleveland had a couple of free agent signings in there that they went out and got the other, the other squads that they got all these guys through the draft. Now, even if you take the approach that we suggested, only one of your starters would be acquired via free agency. The other mm -hmm. four would be through the draft. Yep. Darisaw draft. Um, John Michael Schmitz would, the would in theory be through the draft. Yep. Um, Cleveland. Have to be them on rookie skill contracts. Right. Draft. And then Brian O'Neill draft. So, mm -hmm. um, the approach that we're suggesting is one that falls in line with how it is done by mm -hmm. other teams who get into the top five. So, um, you know, a healthy approach and one that is feasible for the Vikings, given where they are right now, this is not pie in the sky. This is yep. something they can do if they put the resources to it. And I think building on that, another trend here underneath the general uh, rankings here is all of these top line units all have amazing centers. The number one uh, 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 ranked one was the Eagles, and they have Jason Kelsey. Kelsey, yep. Phenomenal. Uh, the Cleveland Browns, they have Nick Harris. Uh, he performed very, very well. Um, he was a backup to uh, to Ethan. So they were a little bit patchwork, but both players performed phenomenally. Um, yep. The Cleveland Browns have had a top five offensive line for the last few years. They had J.C. Treader before. He was another top yep. three center. He was doing great. Uh, the Detroit Lions have Frank Ragnow. He's yep. a phenomenal center. The Tampa drafted, Bay Buccaneers have Ryan him. Jensen. Yep, yep. exactly. Yep. Uh, and the Green Bay Packers have Josh Myers. Um, so when you think about that, the, those top line units, they have a very strong presence at the center position. Yep. Yep. I think, you know, and I think the key there is with the offensive line is just the synergy. I think mm -hmm. you hear head coaches, offensive coordinators, and offensive line coaches say this phrase a lot during mm -hmm. training camp. They say, we're just looking for the five best guys, mm -hmm. right? Yep. That we all get wrapped up in, well, he's a left guard. Ah, he's a right tackle. This, this, yeah. they don't care. It's like, yep. we want the five best linemen. Mm -hmm. We're going to identify them as early as possible in mm -hmm. August. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to put them out on the field and we're going to, as, for as long as we can, it's those five. We're not changing it. Yep. We're not changing it unless someone gets hurt yep. or someone just cannot play. Yep. You know, because they want that synergy above all else, above yep. talent, above physical dominance, above size. They want yep. synergy. Yep. Trust and synergy. I think it's huge. I've, I've heard uh, offensive lines compared a lot to the Navy SEALs. Uh, I actually uh, went to high school with a, a guy that in that category. And uh, ultimately, they, they talk about the abilities and the, the, uh, the, the concept of trust as two separate concepts within the SEAL community. And you can have yeah. the best SEAL in the world, but if you don't trust him, I don't want to go into battle with him. Versus if you have a guy that's kind of a lower performer, yeah. but uh, I trust him, I'd much rather go into the battle with that. And I think that goes hand in hand with that synergy. So it's very advantageous to not shake that up. I know a lot of yep. fans say, oh, he's performing not that great. Change him out to the other guy and try him out. Unless you have very clear intel that the other guy is going to be better, it's not worth changing it out because of that synergistic element yep. that you're mentioning. Agreed. Yep, I totally agree. Um, all right, let's have an on-air production meeting here. Let's, we'll, we'll wrap up this episode here. Next week, um, I think we need to recap the combine uh, for folks and talk about what we heard and saw now, we've already had some things come out. In fact, both the Vikings head coach and GM have already had their press conferences. So in theory, we could have broken that down here, but there are still some on-field workouts that need to happen. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll hear rumors and rumblings coming from Indy over the weekend. So mm -hmm. next week on the Wobcast 2.0, we'll break down some of our thoughts and observations from the combine. And I think the position group we should focus on is, uh, I think we should stay on offense. We've done receivers already. Mm -hmm. We've had Kurt Cousins conversation intertwined in every episode. Um, and now we've done offensive line. So let's hit on the running backs next week mm -hmm. and let's talk combine because yeah. I think the running back situation is very interesting for the Vikings with mm -hmm. two bona fide starting caliber running backs, uh, both of whom either are getting paid a lot right now in the case of mm -hmm. Delvin cook or are in line to get paid a lot in the case of Alexander Madison. And yeah. I think there are, is actually some talent on the roster beyond Madison and cook could All not right. agree more. 
Yeah. So let's talk yep. running backs next week on the Wobcast 2.0. And we'll also hit on the combine, give some thoughts and observations. Um, other than that, my notebook has been emptied. You guys got anything else? No, I think that clears it up. I'm really excited for this off season. It's going to be a really exciting next few weeks as uh, free agency starts the legal tampering period. Now that the combine's wrapping up, uh, yeah. this is the time that I live for. Yeah, it is. It's a lot of fun. I think there's going to be some juicy NFL uh, news notes and nuggets too that come out that we can talk about. I think there's going to be some, um, you know, the sale of the Washington commanders, some rules mm -hmm. changes, um, things like DeAndre Hopkins potentially being on the trade block, um, all sorts of fun stuff that's going to happen here uh, across the NFL as the business season in the NFL is fully underway. So mm -hmm. uh, we encourage you to listen next week to the Wobcast 2.0 with lots of exciting stuff coming up. And if you haven't, uh, please listen to some of our past episodes of the Wobcast 2.0. You can find them wherever you find all your other favorite podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts. You can also catch us on YouTube. Find me on Twitter at Wabi. Engage with us there. Let us know what you want to talk about, what you want to hear about. We love it when fans help direct the content of the show because we are here to talk about the things that you want to hear about. So that's going to do it for this episode of the Wobcast for Giles and Chase. I'm Wabi signing off for now. Skull Vikings.